This is KHBR, the voice of darkness for the intrepid travelers of the left-hand path. I'm Magister Robert Adams, your host. We'll be accompanying you on your journey. So get ready, sit back, relax, and prepare to kefir and remanifest. Welcome to KHPR, the voice of darkness. I'm Magister Robert Adams, your host, and today we have the pleasure of having directly in our studio with us, the founder of the Temple of Set, Dr. Michael Aquino. Dr. Aquino, welcome. Thank you for being here. It's a pleasure to be here, Magister Adams. Now, you founded the temple in 1975, and there are a lot of things out there on the internet that people read as to how and why. So I figured the best place to start was why you felt a need to found the Temple of Set. To tell that story, I really have to go back to uh, my original curiosity uh, in life because I became involved in philosophy and the occult because of curiosity, not because I was looking for power or prestige or influence, but simply because I wanted to find out what was really going on, what this phenomenon of existence is, why we're here, if there is a reason, how can we find it? What should we be thinking about ourselves and what is our significance and our consequence here as rational, intelligent, self-aware beings? I can't pretend that this all happened while I was in grammar school. I can say that I was uh, given the usual exposure to conventional churches. My parents sent me around to the usual mix of Sunday schools and hoped that something might stick. Nothing did. I generally stopped believing in uh, conventional religion about the same time that I stopped believing in the Easter Bunny and Santa Claus. Actually, I think I probably hung on to the Easter Bunny a little longer. In any case, um, by the time I would say that I had graduated from college, I was pretty much an existentialist in the uh, post-war vein that we don't really know why we're here, what we're doing, but we sort of do what seems to be best for us on a day-to-day -day basis and not really try to figure out anything beyond that, except that uh, together with Sartre and some of those kinds of existentialists, there was the underlying question of why should we be here at all? Uh, why, sh why are things as they are? And is there any point in, in even speculating about this or should we just say to hell with it? and get on with the sensual experience of living uh, according to whatever code seems best to us. Well, to me that was adequate, but it was not satisfactory. There was a still gnawing curiosity within me to get behind this mysterious curtain of why we should be here, why things are as they are. And by sheer accident, that led me to Anton LaVey and the Church of Satan. That was in 1968, and at that time Anton LaVey was a sort of a um, minor sensation, rather rather a darling of San Francisco in the latter Haight-Ashbury era, sort of a um, Emperor Norton with horns, um, favorite son of the city, that kind of thing. Yeah, I've seen several pictures of him attending, like, the opening of Rosemary's Baby. Sure. And, uh, I, I mean, I can even remember as a kid in the Richmond district, uh, walking into Jeffrey's Toys and seeing him in there with Xena. And, I, I mean, I think I was, like, nine or ten at the time, and I knew who he was. Well, I went to one of his lectures and listened to him um, talk about his interest in Satanism and black magic. And something about him suggested to me that he just might have an inside key to this big mystery. It wasn't so much the question of evil or of destructiveness or even of some kind of occult power as it was that somehow he seemed to suggest that he had penetrated that reason why we are as we are, what the, what the mystery of humanity is. And then if you begin to look back through history and culture into satanic imagery, meaning various Satan figures of various religions or traditions or mysticisms, you find that the common thread is that they're held together by 
the breakthrough of that mystery. There is a forbidden door that we're not supposed to go through in any particular belief system. That's the door that is guarded by the Satan figure, the uh, demon, if you will, the god against the gods, the bad god, whatever. Everything else is okay. There's one door you're not supposed to go through. There's one tree in the Garden of Eden whose apples you aren't supposed to eat. Right. Why? Because it gives you the knowledge of good and evil and necessarily thus the knowledge of yourself and why you are able to discern and to decide upon good and evil. That's what got me interested in the Church of Satan. And despite the Church of Satan's um, colorful antics and ceremonies and what you might call um, uh, amusing social criticism, that was really what it was at the core that interested me and that indeed interested those of us who uh, attained the satanic priesthood at the time. And over a nine-year period, roughly, from when I joined the church from 69, uh, um, not nine years, but 69 to 75, about uh, six years, the church became less and less of a, um, I would say, a social carnival and more serious and introspective because all of us involved in it, w with it were becoming more caught up in this particular is issue, this aspect of it. There's a door here into our souls that's being gradually opened, and what exactly is it? If you go and attend a normal religious ceremony in a conventional church, it's a kind of a dead experience. You go into a room, uh, there may be elaborate ritual, there may be beautiful visual things, people muttering stuff in Latin or whatever else. But it's dead in the sense that there is no involvement of your soul. You're an audience. You're watching something. It's what the Marine Corps used to call a magic show. Yeah, I can see that. And <clears throat> the difference that we began to sense in the early Church of Satan was simply that if you created a ritual chamber, and by a ritual chamber I don't necessarily mean just a specific room that was decked out in red and black, but a, any kind of surroundings that, that increased and enhanced your sense of concentration and the serious, you very quickly became aware that you were activating some part of your consciousness, some part of your soul that normally you wouldn't go near and normally you wouldn't touch. And at the same time that you were enhancing this aspect of yourself, there was the sensation that there are there is some kind of another consciousness out there that is uh, harmonizing with mine, that is activating it, that is activated by it, that gives us the sensation that, my goodness, there's something actually happening here. This isn't just going to a dead environment, but this is, this is electric. This is active. There is an energy field that is somehow building up here, which is what we refer to as the powers of darkness. It has nothing to do with funny-looking demons you know, wandering through the ritual chamber, but rather a, an entire atmosphere of an electric sort of metaphysical presence that you become aware of. It's very difficult to describe this unless you have actually tried it, which is why in the Temple of Set, um, when we would give ritual instructions, for example, in our guidance books, we would always say, this is like a Shakespeare play. You can't just read it. You actually have to do it to understand what this is all about. You can describe sex, you can describe riding a bicycle to people. Until they have actually done it, you can talk yourself blue in the face, they won't know what you're talking about. Right. What, what for example, balance is all about when you're trying to ride a bicycle. You get on the bicycle, you fall on your ass several times, and then suddenly your awareness of balance kicks in. Oh, that's what this is. And suddenly becoming expert on a bicycle is a little bit like becoming at one with the Tao. The bicycle rides itself. And just as you can tie your shoes or tie a necktie automatically, you can ride a bicycle without thinking about it. And as a matter of fact, you can't really think about balance on a bicycle and have it make coherent sense. Well, the same holds true 
with black magical ritual, or which we would call greater black magic in that sense. Yeah, and actually our current high priest uh, had once used the description of learning how to drive a stick shift car, is there's a lot of things you have to think about, the clutch, when to shift, uh, what RPMs you're going to shift, and all that, and after a while, you don't have to think about that anymore. It's become a part of you, and you've sort of become one with the car. And um, I know for myself, one of my fondest memories that actually happens on a very regular basis is before a ritual that I've put together with other people is ready to be taken care of. Um, we're all fretting over, oh my God, is this going to happen? Is this going to work? And as soon as the bell rings nine times, everything just snaps right into place and the ritual comes off perfectly every time. And yet still, we, we have this unsettlingness before the ritual, but once the ritual starts, we all change into something else. You know, we become more of who we are. And I think that really helps us out a lot. The fact that we understand that is there's the outside the ritual uh, person that you are, and then there's the inside the ritual person that you are. Now, the event that happened in 1975 came about largely because uh, Anton LaVey himself, although he also was becoming more and more aware of this aspect of the door that he had opened, still was drawn to the Church of Satan as a kind of a social circus, you might say. And the tension between these grew. You can either operate something as a sort of a community entertainment uh, device in which you occupy a position of personal glamour, or you can become interested in it more and more for its metaphysical reality. And there was a tension here that I think just kept tugging at him, aggravated to some extent by the fact that the Church of Satan as an organization of people was very much an amateur organization. This was not a slick operation that was somehow set up to function very smoothly like some of, like oh, I don't know, the Freemasons or the Rosicrucians or something. Right. This was something in which we were all exploring a mysterious new realm and doing it very ad hoc and trying to figure out, again, who we were, what we were doing. The same held true for Anton, and I think he finally reached a point beyond which he was simply not prepared emotionally to go. So in 1975, he made a decision that he was going to treat the Church of Satan pretty much as a personal business and back away from exploring it further in terms of being a metaphysical key. And the uh, satanic priesthood, I'd say, um, by and large, pretty much most, most if not all of us, uh, weren't, un, weren't, weren't uh, satisfied with this at all. We felt that it was essentially a betrayal of the higher church that we had all uh, dedicated ourselves to. So at that point we made a decision to leave the Church of Satan and um, the initial idea was to perhaps found another Church of Satan. It would be a reformed one if you will. <laughs> um, at that time I conducted on the North Solstice uh, June 21st to June 22nd of 1975 a personal working in which I was invoking the highest sense of the Prince of Darkness to which I, as a Magister Templi in the Church of Satan, believed that I had access, essentially asking the simple and direct question, what should we do at this point? Uh, should we, in fact, take this forward? Um, should we try to, as I said, create a second Church of Satan of some sort? What exactly is this juncture point um, that we have reached. And it was also a very stressful one because in the original Church of Satan there was also a good deal of affection and loyalty for Anton LaVey. The fact that he had made this decision was very disturbing to us and particularly to me. And therefore this was not simply a pleasant intellectual exercise. It was one under a good deal of consternation and upset and stress at the time. 
Well, the result was this working called the Book of Coming Forth by Night, in which to put this in language which would be meaningful, I think, to your listeners, I would say that I became intensely sensitive to a consciousness that was not my own in a ritual surrounding, in a ritual circumstance. This was not a case of an ancient Egyptian god appearing in the flesh in front of me and telling me what to write down in the dictated document, uh, the Book of Coming Forth by Night. This was a, an extremely rarefied and heightened sense of awareness, a sort of, again, a, a hyper-electric sense of something besides myself that I suddenly had a mental connection with, a, a harmonization with. Uh, it's very hard to describe it beyond that. And indeed, when I look back on the text of the Book of Coming Forth by Night, I look on it as a kind of a reduction, a kind of an approximation of that entire experience, which was roughly from midnight till about 4 a.m. on that night because I was at that time writing down the sensations that I was experiencing in my head, in my consciousness, that sort of forced themselves, willed themselves out into existence as though they sort of needed to be said, needed to be expressed. It was not something where I was looking around searching for correct words or saying, well, there's something that I feel like I want to say. I was a passive participant in this process uh, almost in the way that, say, Michelangelo used to say that when he approached a, a block of marble, he didn't set out to carve a statue. There was a statue in the marble, and it insisted that it be carved, and he simply provided the hands to do it, right. to cut away the excess stone. Well, I was sort of cutting away the, the excess uh, non-essentials from the sensation that was the book of coming forth by night, and that's what emerged in text form. And even then, as I said, as I look at it today, it seems to me to be almost an approximation of the actual, the original uh, experience, because many of these things are very difficult to reduce to words. Take the central word that came from the Book of Coming Forth by Night, Kefir. That has an ancient Egyptian meaning, it has a several more modern meanings as the Temple of Set today has developed it. But it was a word that at the time was again a sort of an abstract exclamation of something extremely powerful that said this is the key that takes humanity beyond being a simple experience of something in time and place as a meat machine in the universe and raises it beyond that, frees it from that takes you out of the restrictions of your four-dimensional existence into something else. This is a little bit like Obi-Wan Kenobi saying to Luke Skywalker, you've just taken your first step into a larger universe. So that was the experience. And when it was over, my first response to it was one of great bewilderment. I had not expected to run into set. I had not expected the notion of creating something entirely new, such as the Temple of Set, and, and so radically different from what the Church of Satan had been. Up until then, I was a confirmed Satanist. I believed in Satan and the powers of darkness in that context, as we had been developing till then. This was something radically different. Um, I spent some time talking with other friends of mine who had been senior priests and priestesses in the Church of Satan, asking their opinions about it and what they thought about it. And when they read the text, um, all of them that I spoke with said that its authenticity seemed to radiate out to them to, that to catch something in them that suggested that it was an authentic document also. Nevertheless, any sort of a personal experience 
through meditation or through ritual is just that it's a personal experience mm -hmm. how do you test this how do you decide whether it's relevant to other people because otherwise the book of coming forth by night and anything involved in it could just simply be something of significance to me right like a poet who has a dream or an inspiration the issue was is this something that has an application that has relevance to other individuals to other persons who have isolate self-consciousnesses and that's what the temple of set uh, was created to do it wasn't just me either who put it together um, in the priesthood those directly involved were perhaps about I would say 25 to 30 of us with and an initial membership of maybe around 100 all at that time alumni of the Church of Satan but we were setting out to take this concept of kefir and essentially to fly it the way one builds a model airplane and then starts up the engine and sees whether the thing is going to pick up off the ground the idea was to take these principles to take this license from set that we had received first we all of course we had to do a lot of investigation to find out who set was sure because none of us were experienced Egyptologists but neither did we feel that we had to be because we were apprehending set we were having a an experience of set that was not just simply looking him up in old Wallace budge books <laughs> this was the direct authorization by what uh, for better or for worse might be called a god or a netter some kind of a conscious being that was above and beyond ourselves it became closer and closer associated in our mind with Plato's notion of first principles of a kind of energy source that was in fact the author or the inspiration or the generalization of this entire concept of individual self-consciousness the thing that in a particular sense makes me me makes you you and makes anybody listening to this broadcast today an individual being because my universe of consciousness radiates outward from me everything that I know everything that is real comes together in my awareness of it thus you Magister Adams are a kind of an extension of my perception of reality right if my consciousness were to block out suddenly just zip off then as far as I am concerned you would also vanish similarly the same would hold true from your point of view to me we have and this is actually a rather large step we have come to the conclusion that there is an objective connection between our consciousnesses that enables us to rely upon the fact that you are not a figment of my imagination and I am not a figment of yours so there is a collective what you would say material reality to the universe but there is also a kind of a collective bridge between this notion of one individual consciousness and another and that overriding principle that sort of mega source that ground zero of the principle of each person's individual sense of self-consciousness of uniqueness is what we call set you could call it a giant bubble gum wrapper if you want <laughs> but we use the term set because that's how it came to me in the book of coming forth by night and that historically is essentially what we found set to be the first enunciation or articulation of this principle in human history that we have come across that has become uh, somewhat mirrored in later civilizations and mythologies including the uh, Judeo-Christian bastardization as you'd have to call it of Satan which is just a pale reflection of what this original thing was sure now set as a literal being is something that I receive emails about and I, I think you've kind of covered that in what you've said um, but essentially we aren't saying like <clears throat> we have Seth's telephone number and we can just pick up the phone and give him a call. I mean, it is something that exists. It is conscious. Therefore, 
it is a being, but not a being like you or I are beings. Well, I would say I would say this that, and let me talk first a little bit about the material universe here, sure. because I want to talk about the other, what you might call Egyptian gods or Neteru. When we look out at the things around us in the physical universe, we see what? We see matter, we see pieces of things that exist. We see matter and energy, and we also see a, a consistency and a harm, harmony of these things throughout the universe, which gives us science, because science essentially is the art of being able to predict things, that they will be, if you put these two things together, in a chemical reaction, they'll produce this thing. If you measure the velocity of light here, it's going to be the same as it is on Alpha Centauri. So when we look outward with the eyes of science, we find that there is a, a reliability of existence, and then there is a consistency. And related things such as a harmony, things tend to work well with each other in the ways that they do function. You don't find a whole lot of matter and antimatter smashing into each other all the time. You find largely a universe of matter, of atoms that pretty much get along with each other. And you find symmetry in this, you find harmony in this. It's a well-working machine. When people think of God, what do they really think of? Do they think of some old man in a Santa Claus suit? They might if they're still at the comic book level of their religion. But the more sophisticated you get, the more you approach this notion that what most people understand as God is simply the sum total of the things that keep everything functioning in its place and that sort of put it there in the first place. This takes us back a little bit to the dilemma of the existentialists. Why are things as they are? Why are they not otherwise? Why are they why are we not in the middle of a chaotic jumble of of craziness from one moment to the other. This consistency, this strong sense of universal integrity is, I think, what you would have to say most people would ultimately come to regard as what God is all about, or what the gods, the Egyptian Neteru, because that's a sort of a collective representation of that, are all about. We find, for example, that um, if you are going to blaspheme against God, how do you do it? Uh, it's very hard if you use anything in the material universe to do it. For example, if I were to pick up a glass of water and throw it across the room in anger, that isn't really an act of blasphemy against God in his highest sense, because he controls, uh, or the Neteru control, all the physical laws that are involved in my throwing that glass across the room, the gravity, where it's going to land, what happens to the glass, these are all parts of that. I would say the closest you could come to blaspheming against that kind of God or gods, that kind of the universal principle of organization of the universe, is what they did at uh, Trinity in 1945. When you take some atoms that are perfectly happy being what they are and are sort of designed to be that way and you blow them up and you create a nuclear bomb that's blasphemy there you are disrupting the natural order of things and look what you get a real mess yeah okay so now look at this notion of set of the netter against the netters the the opposite perspective. This is the thing that is you against all else. The way that we can apprehend all of the Neteru, all of the existence, or if you like, the way that you can even apprehend God, is because you are different. You are something else. If you were part of this, then it would be impossible for you to see it, because you would be a piece of it. It is this very notion that we are somehow able to step outside of the whole thing, that we have elected to, as Milton put it, to reign in hell rather than serve in heaven. Right. We have stepped a part of it, we have wrenched our consciousnesses outside of it, 
and suddenly we are something looking at it. The moment that we can looking the moment that we can look at it like Archimedes and his lever, we can move it. We can do those kinds of things. Either we can rearrange it and take glass and make it into a glass of water and fill it with water. Or we can bust it up like they did at Trinity in 1945 and mess it up really bad. The point is that as magicians, as black magicians, we are then in a position where we can mess with God. We can change him around. We can adjust this. If we are creative and wise, we can do this beautifully and create works of great art and great creativity. We can become as gods ourselves. If we are irresponsible, then we can blow ourselves up and turn this planet into a radioactive mess. So when we start looking for set, what are we looking for? Well, we have this thing called individual consciousness. Each one of us has this. Each one of us is a sort of a micro set in that sense. And when we are looking to meet set, when we are saying, how can I apprehend this great principle that is underlying all of our consciousness, it is, I can put it no better than to say that you focus upon this thing that is within yourself and then you start dialing up the energy. And you reach what Plato referred to as a state of noesis in which your consciousness becomes first harmonious with and then almost indistinguishable with this furnace or source from whence it came. And then you will see set in such a clear way that it's almost stunning but it also is almost beyond expression because what you have done now is to take your consciousness and raise it up to his. Suddenly it is not a question of you meeting set. You and set become the same thing. You become a single source, a single focus of energy. This is greater black magic at its most potent. It again is something that you can't teach. You can only experience it. And sometimes you experience it and you don't even know it. Right. Because you haven't put a name to it. Some of the greatest philosophers of history, some of the greatest visionaries and artists have attained a kind of a supernatural ecstasy of creativity that just simply washes out of them uh, in a great great burst of energy and they can't put a name to it. Um, this is really what the Temple of Set is all about. We are not trying to teach people to worship an ancient Egyptian god. We are not trying to send people on a power trip. We are unlocking the thing that is them or rather helping them to unlock it. And once they do, once you do, there's really nothing that we need to do to be involved in your personal quest, your personal grail adventure. It then will soar up to the stars quite on its own. And I would emphasize one other thing. Some people say, well, is this just for Setians? Is this just for the Temple of Set? Are you saying that you guys can do this and the rest of us can't? And I would say, absolutely not. This is something that is absolutely inherent in the human equation. Any conscious being, and as we are now beginning to explore in the Temple of Set, conscious beings other than humans in the animal kingdom as well, have this sense of utter self-deification within them. The reason that they haven't become aware of it is because they don't know that it's there. They haven't tried. What happens when you get born? You get, you, you're, you're born, you get slapped on the ass, you start crying, and as for most people, that's it. Variations on that for the rest of their lives. They live in a stimulus response physical universe where as far as they're concerned, their entire existence is just the sensations that come in through their five senses and the things that they push out through their physical bodies. And that's their limit. Just a simple case of cause and effect for yes. them. And they don't bother to go beyond that. Some because they're perfectly happy being meat machines and happy animals. Others because they're scared. 
or because they are sort of taught by religion or uh, materialistic science that there is nothing else out there. There's nothing, you aren't worth anything beyond your stimulus, stim, your stimulus response uh, existence. And what we have said is no, this is not true. In fact, you have just scratched the surface. This is just the bicycle lying there on the floor. Once you get up and you learn how to ride it, and the balance is there, then the bicycle becomes incidental. It's now an entire experience in a higher realm of being. So a setian will look pretty much the same as anybody else. We still have to put on our pants one legs at the time in the morning, but this is not the center energy source of our existence anymore. We are rapidly becoming and becoming self-aware that we are immortal senses of consciousness, that we are centers of energy that extend not only through the physical lifetime of these envelopes in which we find ourselves right now, but in fact infinitely into the past and infinitely into the future, which is what Plato was talking about in his principle of anamnesis. And this is the real key to immortality that has nothing to do with reincarnation, nothing to do with cryogenesis, but simply realizing that the thing that is authentically, really, truly you, can't be touched and can't be restricted and can't be influenced by that physical envelope in which it is right now using as training wheels on that bicycle just to identify itself. Right, and, and people do this through the use of the word that you received from Set, and that is kefir. And that translates to to come into being. Uh, some of us nowadays use the term self-transformation, self-evolution. Uh, it's bringing about a change in yourself that you realize and you project out into the world around you. I mean, there are people that I haven't seen in 10 years, and I meet them, and they go, what's happened to you? You know, and <clears throat> they see the change. I don't really need to go into all the details as to how I got the way I am, but it's something that's noticeable. And I also tend to think that it doesn't just happen on an individual level, but also on a group level in that the temple itself has over the years i mean i've been in about 17 years now that i think about it and that's kind of shocking to me when i, I there's nothing i've done for 17 years but the evolution that i've seen within the temple and not not just with uh using the internet more but the way the people we are getting are already on their way when they come to the door they aren't like green twigs basically you know little plants starting to grow they've already done the research uh and then they come to us because they want more this principle of kefir by whatever name you choose to refer to it is not something on which the temple of set has some kind of an exclusive franchise or copyright we're simply the first in recent history to really articulate this thing and to focus on it and to develop the Temple of Set as what I've sometimes referred to as a toolbox to use in exploring it. And other Setians are pretty much, I suppose, the same things. We come together not because we need one another as crutches or as props for ceremonies to impress one another, but because we are all individuals who are embarked on our own individual versions of this same quest of self-exploration. Since we, uh, we share certain interests here, uh, it's useful to us to compare notes. And that's pretty much what the Temple of Set is. We're a bunch of individuals who have this, sense, this same common awareness, the same common interest, but we each have it uh, 
in a way that is necessarily unique to ourselves. So I can tell, I, I know what my sensation and experiences of this is. I can never communicate it completely to you. But right. I can discuss parts of it with you. And I can hear parts of yours as you are able to communicate them to me. And that creates a certain perspective, a certain complementary atmosphere in which each of us can refine his thinking and his understanding of this a little bit more. When you get a bunch of us together, it's just that much more the same. A group working or a group ceremony of the Temple of Set is like bringing a bunch of stars together into a close perspective. Oh, yeah. We're not all doing the same thing. Each of us is doing his or her own thing. We're just doing it in fairly close proximity. And there's a certain amount of, of cross-transference of sensation and atmosphere that happens in the process, which is interesting. It's stimulating. And I suppose it's, in some cases, because this is it can, can at times be a scary adventure, it's somewhat reassuring that we're not going nuts. When you start to become the sole arbiter, the sole god of your inhabited universe, you're, you become the arbiter of good and evil. You become the person who judges things in terms of their consequence and their reality and their significance. That's a heavy burden to bear. You need to take extra care to make sure that you are looking at this in a way that is not insane, that is ethical, that is going to essentially enhance your mental coherence and your being rather than disrupt it or turn you into something that is sort of a, a chaotic being in the Lovecraft monster mold. Right. And that actually reminds me of something that I'd like to bring up is you definitely have to have a personality that's very grounded and stable if you want to do this because we've we've seen people outside the organization who use their own techniques uh, and that are not exactly good um, there was one person who would drink an entire bottle of Robitussin that contains uh, the drug de dextromethorphan which in small doses is fine, but when you drink a whole bottle of it, it becomes a wonderful hallucinogen. And um, it, he was basically insane. And uh, he was, you know, saying he was channeling set. And I would ask him some questions. And he was, what he was coming back with was utter nonsense. And it, it wasn't making sense. So, you know, I, I think I said, how do, how do you know it was set? It was, well, he told me. I said, oh, okay, I'm set. You going to believe me? And, you know, if someone is bipolar uh, or needs to take any kind of uh, antidepressant type of medication, that's going to cause problems for them working within our structure. And we, we definitely, I know, we like to tell people who... When they tell us this, you know, maybe this isn't the temple you've been looking for. And, um, I mean, you do need a good foundation. Well, that, that impacts you really in two ways. First of all, we may concentrate and focus upon the metaphysical essence of our consciousness. But for the time being, particularly as we are talking here right now, we are still incarnated in these bodies. Right. We still live in an objective world controlled by those other Neturu in which we not only interact between ourselves as gods and goddesses, but also as just ordinary people, as beings, as functioning animals on a day-to-day -day basis. Not just, of course, within a group like the Temple of Set, but out there in everyday society in which we have to go to jobs, uh, we have to get along with other people. We, we have to work harmoniously with other beings, some of whom may have the slightest idea what we're talking about. So, yes, you have to remember that you exist in two worlds in this sense. There is the physical one in which you have to maintain your coherence and your sense of cooperation. You, you have to be an integrated social being hopefully a wiser one, because you now understand a lot more about that society and why it is, why it functions as it does. 
and then you have your metaphysical realm of consciousness which is not bounded by any of this in which you can go to the land of Oz and have tea with Ozma and Dorothy if you would like to do so right the other thing has to do with this very notion of the uh, empowerment and elevation of your consciousness per se and the example we have sometimes used in the Temple of Set um, just to give people an illustration of this is in the the movie Forbidden Planet right in which you have the artificial boosting of human intelligence unfortunately along with the wisdom come id monsters the those animalistic vicious parts of your subconscious that create monsters so that's I would say a little bit more what you were just referring to when you start talking to somebody about black magic and initiation and you start giving him these keys and he starts applying them yes he's going to get a supercharge to his sense of self-awareness and intelligence along with it can come ego inflation and if you're not <laughs> careful you can get this id monster phenomenon yeah. where a person goes nuts and says suddenly I am the God and every and the rest of the world is properly my slaves or I'll just eat them <laughs> like Yog Sothoth <laughs> and we have had uh, a lot of I would say some somewhere between the comical and the bitter experiences of this over the years because we are exploring an area of the human experience here that has not been explored before this is new territory nobody has been in the business of turning human beings into gods before and gotten very far away with it certainly not as far as we have right and usually when people have tried it in the past they've screwed it up and it's become very bad look what happened to the Nazis who didn't look at it from this kind of a metaphysical standpoint they were talking about making some human beings sort of gods in this material universe and what happened uh, got very evil very fast wound up doing an immense amount of damage causing an immense amount of pain and suffering and certainly did not produce your uh, gods on earth so to speak that the Nazis were at one point thinking about doing when this has happened in other cultures where it's the Maya or or you name it uh, the results have usually been bad so in the temple of set for one thing we have not really focused on trying to take the teachings of the temple of set and project them into any kind of social control we're not setting out to construct some sort of a setian state or super state right. or utopia we emphasize that this is inevitably and should be inexorably a personal quest this is a personal adventure into the mysteries of your soul this is to find the thing that is you and raise it to its divine potential it is not to become uh, the toughest guy on the block the wisest guy on the block yes sure but that's a whole different story yeah I know uh, someone once said um, in answer to the question you know well, would you like it if everyone what in the world was a member of the temple and they said that would be absolute chaos well I would say that to the extent that the temple of set is a an organization of ordinary human beings we're not set up to handle anything that complicated yeah I would say to the extent that would we like to see everybody experience SETI in consciousness that'd be wonderful sure you would see a cessation of all wars you would see the uh, warming of the globe stop instantly you would see all kinds of wise and good things happening because one of the results of going deeper into yourself as again Plato realized when he said that the good is not something that has to be forced or argued into existence it is there as a kind of a virtue in itself the more that you awaken the thing in you that is divine the more you will find that you are drawn to the good 
That's why things like the id monster business is an aberration and an accident. It's done when this process isn't happening correctly. If it handles correctly, you not only become wiser, you become nicer. And you become more altruistic, not just because of, not simply because of your own pleasure or existence, but because the entire sensation of conscious existence becomes the thing that is sacred to you. That, if somebody were to say, well, do you worship Set? Yes. And what is Set? It is the collective phenomenon of conscious existence and self-awareness. And yes, we worship that. It is a wonderful, magnificent, beautiful thing. Now, in what we've been talking about, we've been, yes, we've been talking about uh, a lot about the Egyptian side of things, but one of the things that I found remarkable when I first joined the Temple of Set was that it wasn't wholly focused on all things Egyptian. Is there were people who found in the way other cultures worked that they could also apply the, the concept of Kefir. So we aren't just an Egyptian temple, while we do have set as the focus, there are many ways you can achieve kefir within the organization. One of the, at the time, rather strange aspects of the book in Coming Forth by Night was its question that, was its comment was, which I'm just paraphrasing now, that I am no longer simply to be found in ancient Kim. At the time, I suppose this simply meant that the ancient gods were no longer worshipped in Egypt. It's now an Islamic country, whatever, so we don't really have to make pilgr pilgrimages there the way that a Muslim would do to Mecca. Right. But, as with so many other things of the Book of Coming Forth by Night, over the years I began to get a much more subtle and sophisticated understanding of that, which is that when we talk about set, we're talking and we use that term, that's a term of respect for the antiquity of this particular awareness, of this particular netter, of this principle, in the first way that it was apprehended in human history that we're aware of. So that's the most ancient name, if you will, that has been put to this. But just as consciousness is not something that was unique to the ancient Egyptians, neither is this principle unique in terms of its presence in other cultures as well. So if you go to the ancient Norse legends or you go to the ancient Mesoamerican legends, any place on earth, in China, India, you will find this same principle. You will find the god that is not of the gods, the being that is somehow different from all the others, the sensation of perspective, of difference, of, of what you would say a, a certain ecstatic creativity that is not necessarily bound by or in harmony with the laws of the universe. And indeed, I came to see that as reinforcing the authenticity of this revelation or this apprehension. Because if we were simply coming up with a principle that the ancient Egyptians understood, but that was totally absent from human consciousness anyplace else on the planet, what would that suggest? Right. It would be far too isolated, and it would only apply within that culture. Right. And if you weren't of that culture, then you wouldn't have access to it. So the Temple of Set remains the Temple of Set in a sort of a traditional or historic sense, because, again, this is where it all started, as far as we know. But in our explorations over the years, in our multiculturalism, we have branched out worldwide to a great many cultures, and you will see that in uh, our orders, in our pylon specialties, in our writings. This is something that is a phenomenon of the human existence. I think that if we were to go up and visit some Eskimos, we would find it there. Yeah. Well, would you have any final thoughts that you would like to uh, end this interview with? Well, there's one thing that I 
have said to many people who I've sort of talked with this, who've sort of questioned me as non-members of the Temple of Set, do we have to join the Temple of Set or become Setians to partake of this thing? And my answer is always the same. Absolutely not. This is a factor in each and every one of us that is inherent to our sense of self-awareness. This is not something that is a uh, that's something that the Temple of Set hands out or that we have an exclusive key to. We simply have been studying it and focusing on it a lot more than anybody else that I'm aware of right now. So we're a pretty good toolbox for people to find out about this thing if you really want to get into it. But is it something that you have to worry about that you have or don't have? No. This is not one of those religions that's a messiah religion. We're not in the business of saying, well, you have to accept Set, or you have to accept Michael Aquino, or I guess Mr. Hardy, or anyone else. We don't administer grace here. We don't baptize people into saying, if you join this thing, or if you're forgiven of this or that sin, or somehow that you will come into a kind of a Setian paradise. The thing that we are talking about is inherent in every one of us. We, the minute that you are aware that you exist, you have an absolute right to this thing. It's there. All you have to do with that bicycle is ride it. And I would say the same thing to anybody listening to this broadcast, that, sure, is the Temple of Set a good way to explore this and find out more about it? Yes. I think we're doing a pretty good job. We've been working at it for well over 30 years now, and we're pretty good. Yeah. We're pretty pleased with what we've done. But are we selling something that only we say that we have a right to or control of? Absolutely not. Each and every one of you, by the very fact that you can understand what I'm saying, has this thing. All you have to do is flick the on switch. Well, Dr. Aquino, I would like to say thank you very much for this interview. Um, I think this is going to generate a lot of emails to the program and I think it is going to generate a lot more interest in the temple with the public at large uh, especially it's going to dispel some of the myths that people have about what we are and what we do so thank you very much for being on the show thank you for inviting me you've been listening to KHPR the voice of darkness if you have any questions or comments, you can email them to us at khpr at keffer.org. Thank you for listening, and we hope that we've been able to bring about some change for you.